Greetings, my name is Major Adrian DeFreitas and I'm one of the many instructors in the Department of Computer Science. And today I'm going to be talking to you about what a computer is. Now we like to throw around the term computer everywhere and I think it's important to take a step back and talk about it from a more abstract level so we can understand what it generally means to compute. Because as you will find out, a lot more things qualify as computers than you might initially think. So in this lesson, we're going to talk about what a computer is. We're going to talk about this concept of a von Neumann architecture. It's, it's going to describe to us what a general purpose computer is. Then we're going to look at a video that shows us the major computer uh, components, uh, the hardware, and how it fits into that architecture. And then we're going to uh, talk about the memory hierarchy and most importantly, Moore's Law. And Moore's Law is going to help us understand why it is that just even in our lifetimes, we're seeing this drastic increase in the amount of computing that we can do. So computers now are getting faster, they're getting smaller, and they're getting cheaper than ever. And Moore's Law is going to help us understand why that's the case. To get us started, I thought we'd do a quick stroll down memory lane. In the early days of NASA's space program, NASA needed to do a lot of math, as you might imagine, right? They had to calculate orbits, they had to calculate uh, launch trajectories, they had to calculate um, you know, engineering loads on the rockets themselves, and they obviously didn't have computers to do that. So they went and hired people to go and do the math and double check and make sure that the math was right. So these, this picture here is what you could call the first human computers. Uh, there's actually a really interesting video, uh, Hidden Figures, where they talk about how many of the calculators were actually uh, minorities. So that's an interesting part of American history. Uh, but it is cool to see, you know, how you know, how we were able to achieve so much just with, by using people as the, the, com the calculators, right? Here, this is a really interesting picture. I, I love it. Uh, here, this whole thing here is one computer. Uh, and what this uh, guy is doing is he's looking, he's looking at what's called a vacuum tube. In the old days of computing, uh, uh, vacuum tubes are what we used to build them. And what would happen is that insects would sometimes crawl in the vacuum tube and die. Uh, and that would cause the computer to stop working. So this man, uh, he found a bug in the computer. He had to pull it out so the computer would work again. So this is, uh, he was one of the first debuggers. So in the next couple of lessons, when we start coding in Python, uh, we are going to be talking about uh, debugging our code. And this is where that term comes from. So I've shown you some examples of uh, both you know, physical computers, human computers. So let's talk in abstract about what a computer is. Uh, here's the formal definition, but simply put, for this class you can think that a computer is basically anything that can accept information, uh, manipulate that information in some way based off some instructions. Uh, we'll call that an algorithm, but you can just think of it as steps, and then output that uh, result to the world. So, like I said, human beings uh, are can be thought of as computers. This is Fry from my favorite cartoon, Futurama. So if you think about how Fry computes, you know, he has memory of some you know, some extent. Uh, he has eyes and ears to receive input. He has a brain to process that information. And he has hands and mouth to take actions and, you know, output that information to the world. And then his body, his meat bag, is basically what holds all the stuff in one place. Uh, computers are very much the same way. They also have memory to store uh, algorithms, instructions, and data. Uh, they have input devices that they use to get the information. They have a CPU which accesses their brain. They have output devices to get the results, uh, to uh, expose those results to the world. And then their motherboard, uh, or in the, the case, you could think of that as the thing that holds all of that stuff in one place. So in 1945, von Neumann came up with a uh, architecture to describe what he called a general purpose computer. So uh, he wanted to help us understand what it meant to be a computer in terms of like the hardware. And his key revelation was that the memory in a computer should be used to store both instructions as well as the data that you're processing. So in the von Neumann architecture, there are input devices. So you can think of them as like keyboard, mice. These days there's microphones, touch screens, uh, all sorts of things, right? There's a CPU that processes that information and output devices like your monitor, also like your printers, speakers, those sorts of things. And that um, is what is used for the computer to share the result of its computations back to the user. And then there's memory. And memory is used to store, again, both instructions and data. So I'm going to show you now a quick video where we talk about the, uh, the parts of a computer. And while we're doing that, I want you to think about all the, you know, how, how do those parts of a computer, you know, is it an input device, is it the CPU, etc. 
You may already know that there are a lot of important parts inside a desktop computer, but what exactly do they do? In this video, we're going to take a look inside to show you the various components that make a computer work. Every computer has a large circuit board called a motherboard. This contains some of the most important parts of your computer, such as the CPU, also called the Central Processing Unit, or processor. The CPU is sometimes called the brain of the computer because it processes information and carries out commands. Since it tends to get hot, it's covered by a piece of metal called a heat sink, which draws heat away from the processor. The motherboard also contains your computer's RAM, or random access memory. This is the short-term memory that your computer uses whenever it's performing calculations. However, you can't store your files there because the RAM is cleared when you turn off the computer. For long-term storage, your computer uses a hard drive, which keeps all of its data even when the computer is turned off. Most hard drives use a magnetic platter to store data, but many newer computers have solid-state drives, which are faster and more durable, but also more expensive. If you want to upgrade your computer, you can add expansion cards to the motherboard's expansion slots. You can add a video card to get better graphics performance, or you could add a wireless card to connect to your wireless home network. Of course, your computer's components need electricity to run. The power supply unit is designed to take the power from the wall outlet and send it to all the different components that need power. A desktop computer is a pretty complex machine, but now that you've seen what goes on inside, it should be a little less mysterious. So hopefully one of the interesting things you picked out of that video was the idea that we have different types of memory on our computer. In fact, we have a what we call a memory hierarchy that helps us explain the trade-offs between the different types of memory you will find. At the top of our hierarchy, we're going to have memory that is very fast but low capacity and expensive. And on the bottom, we'll have memory that is you know slow, but you can use it to store lots of information. So on the CPU itself, we have memory that we call registers or CPU, and you don't necessarily need to know that unless you become a computer science major, but the key part here is that the memory here is super, super fast, but it's low capacity. So we're talking on the order of megabytes, sometimes only even kilobytes or even bytes. And we'll talk in future lessons about those, you know, what a byte really is. The primary memory that we use on our computer is RAM. That is what we use for storing programs that are running. Um, here, RAM is very fast. Um, but it's not as fast as the cache. Uh, it's normal to have 8, 16, or even 32 gigabytes of RAM on your computer. Um, it's fast, but at the same time, there's faster memory. Most of us are familiar with the hard drive. Our hard drives can store lots of data, right? So uh, the issued laptops come with anywhere between uh, 500 gigabytes, to some cases, one or even two terabytes of memory. So lot, you know, orders of magnitude more than the RAM you have but at the same time it's a lot slower so RAM can be accessed you know in microseconds maybe even nanoseconds hard drive is usually um, milliseconds so you know sometimes a thousand times slower and the slowest memory that we have is uh, what we call archival storage so one example of that is uh, tapes so when I was deployed to Guantanamo Bay one of the things we did every evening was we did a full backup of the network so all the computers the thousands of computers we stored all the hard drives of them on a tape so it only took a couple tapes, and then we took it up to a mountain fortress, and we hit it there. And the idea was that these, these tapes are very, very slow to get the data back from, but you can store immense quantities of data on them. So that was the trade-off. Uh, archival storage can also be thought of as DVDs or CDs. Uh, again, those store lots of information, but it takes a lot of time to, for the computer to load it in. Uh, that's why, like especially on video game consoles, you have to install the game from the DVD to the hard drive because it's just not fast enough to get it from the DVD drive. The final thing we're going to talk about today is Moore's Law. Moore's Law has tons of implications in the computer science community. Uh, there's lots of varying definitions of this, but basically all you need to know is that Moore's Law talks about how much stuff we can put on a circuit, on a chip. So uh, the, the stuff we're talking about is called a transistor. And every two years, I can put twice as much stuff on that chip than I could uh, previously. So grossly simplified, what we're talking about is that the more transistors I have on the chip, the more things the chip can do. So the speed of a computer could roughly double every two years. It's not really true, but you'll see that it is some form of exponential growth. 
and the cost of producing that chip remarkably goes down, right? So you have that perfect flux. I can have the computer do lots of things, but at the same time, the computer is cheaper to manufacture. Uh, Moore's Law is pretty much held up over 50 years. Uh, there are some caveats, and we'll, we can talk about that. Uh, but the big thing is that as the computer gets smaller, um, the chips get smaller, the heat builds up. So you saw in the video that they had those big heat sinks for the CPU. Uh, now we're talking about, you know, instead of just having one CPU on a computer, we can have multi-CPUs. So that's what multi-core computers are. So again, you know, the idea is that I can put lots of stuff. And here's some real-world examples. Um, here is a chart that shows you the number of transistors on various types of uh, chips from the 70s up until 2018. In the early 70s, we could put roughly, um, you know, the order of you know three, four thousand uh, transistors on a chip. That's with the old Intel 4000 series. And then now, if we're talking about uh, the Xbox One or some more modern processors, now we're talking about anywhere between uh, five to 50 million transistors in the same die space. So on the same amount of silicon, we can put a lot more stuff on it. So that's why you're seeing um, dramatic increases. And this looks like a linear increase, but if you look on the y-axis, it's actually a logarithmic scale. So this is showing exponential growth. Uh, here's a modern CPU, in case you were ever curious of what they look like. Uh, you can actually break it apart. Uh, this here is actually the CPU. Uh, and the, this is a Core i7, which has four of them. And then this here, this massive thing here is the GPU, right? Uh, here's a lot of onboard cache. And then the system agent is basically the thing that uh, coordinates all of these various elements. Uh, this is a PlayStation 4 and Xbox One CPU. They look very similar to each other. Again, you know, uh, a long time ago, all we could produce on the chip was maybe enough just to fit the CPU. And now look at all the extra stuff we can put, right? We have eight CPUs on this chip, uh, lots of memory on the side. Uh, and then lots of graphics. So most of this chip is actually a giant graphics core. And then we can actually also see uh, the effects of Moore's Law on you guys, right? So we're looking at various types of uh, cadet metrics. So I have um, from the 90s up till 2015, you can kind of see how cadet the laptops have sped up dramatically, right? So a laptop from 2000 uh, is dramatically slower, orders of magnitude slower than a laptop that was released in 2015. And your guys' laptops are going to swim circles around that 2015 laptop. RAM, we also see uh, interesting increases there. When I was a cadet, uh, we had 256 megabytes of RAM on my uh, laptop, and I thought it was awesome. You know, now, 8, 16, 32 gigabytes is considered standard. So again, that, uh, you know, that exponential growth is alive and well. Hard drive size, we see the same thing. In 2015, uh, 320 gigabytes was a huge hard drive. Now, you know, it's easy to have a terabyte, two terabytes on a machine you know, without breaking a sweat. And what's most interesting about this is that when you look at the cost of the PCs, they really haven't changed. So uh, the blue bars here actually represent when USAFA was issuing desktop computers. Uh, and you see a slight spike as they move to laptops, but you can see that the price pretty much levels out. And the same thing here on green, this is where they uh, switch to tablet computers. Uh, you can see a slight spike, but again, the prices hover around the same. So it's interesting to see that these computers can do a lot more, but the price, you know, the laptop price is uh, you know, roughly the same, but they're getting faster. So you know, the price of computing is actually decreasing over time. You get a lot more for your dollar. To show you what it means in a little bit more, um, let's say more entertaining of a way, uh, I'm a big video game fan, so I like to show uh, clips of video games whenever possible. Here is The Legend of Zelda, for those who have never seen it. Uh, this was on the Nintendo Entertainment System. Uh, the NES had a 1.6 megahertz uh, clock on the CPU. It had 2 kilobytes of RAM, and the game was 96 kilobytes. Uh, I don't know of anything you guys own that only stores 96 kilobytes. Maybe, maybe your CAC might might store that just that little bit of data, but I, I bet you it's more. Um, but again, it, it's a, interesting to see what they were able to do with just that small amount of memory. Here, uh, for those of you who have never seen it, this is Star Fox for the Super Nintendo. So just a few years after the Nintendo came out, now we're talking about 128 kilobytes, so what, 64 times more RAM on that computer? Uh, and the game size went from you know roughly 70 kilobytes or 80 kilobytes to 600 kilobytes for a game. So again, it's interesting to see how much they it's increased. This is my favorite video game. This is Final Fantasy VII. When it was released for the PlayStation, um, 
it, w it was the first console, really the most popular console to have uh, CDs. So 1.8 gigabytes for the game because it was on three CDs. And it was just amazing to see, you know, just how much, you know, the graphics had improved. And now, just recently, I got a chance to play uh, the remake. So this is what the best computer graphics they could produce in the 1990s. Uh, this was pre-rendered, so the computer had to work and produce this video uh, to uh, before they put it on the CD. This is real time, so it's actually running on the same. Uh, it, it's running and being processed on the computer in real time. So, I, I don't even have words. Um, it is so cool to see my childhood uh, games come back to life. But again, just amazing to see what is now possible. That you know, in just 20 short years, we we, we went from you know this to this. So I guess without a doubt it's we've come a long ways right uh, to further hammer it I actually have a, a, some cool advertisements this was an advertisement for an IBM computer it was only eighteen thousand uh, dollars came with its own printer that's kinda cool uh, I think that's the monitor or no actually that's the monitor I have no idea what this is um, similarly this is a, a 10 megabyte hard drive 10 megabytes, uh, and uh, you're going to spend $3,500 on that. And remember, this was in, it looks like the uh, early 80s. It also wasn't that long ago that we were talking about laptops, um, basically being any computer that didn't crush your lap was considered a laptop. And this one here, in the old days, they, they would have, um, you'd have to use a payphone and then connect your phone up to it, and that's how you would download your email. So that's kind of interesting to see how... Uh, how they handled that problem. This, by the way, is a portable computer. You can tell because, you know, it's got the little suitcase, so obviously. And for this video, I wanted to show you, um, this is a video of the Apple Lisa. It was a computer that was released in the early 80s, I think 1984. And here, we're going to see a, uh, a demonstration of something that you guys take for granted, but in the 80s was something they had never seen before. You can actually hear the surprise in their voice as it's happening. It's really funny. So here's my document. Let's do some editing with it. First of all, I'd like to delete some words. What I do is I take my typing bar, I point to the word I want to delete, I hold the button down, and I drag it over the word. I then go up to the pull down menu, I go up to edit, I click on it, I pull down to the word cut, normal words like we use in our office, and it's going to cut out that word. Now I want to make it a little bit easier for our viewing audience to see. I'm going to take the mouse could we try that again? I think that was so quick, it was hard to sure. see. Sure, well, what we're going to do. So it's important to remember that so far we've only been talking about hardware. But software is another major part of computers. And without software, the computer is essentially just a pile of electronics, right? We need to look at how we tell computers to store information in, and more importantly, how to manipulate that information so it can do uh, useful things, right? So how do we build a word processor? How do we, you know, build a video player, a video game, those sorts of things. And we're going to be spending the rest of the course focusing on these topics. And in just a few lessons, you're going to have an opportunity to learn how to code the computer to make it do anything you want. So hopefully this is, has been an informative lesson. We've talked about what a computer is, and hopefully now you understand when we say that, you know, your iPad and your phone are computers, that makes sense. But we're now in a world where our refrigerator and our toaster and our doorbells are now computers. We talked about the von Neumann computer architecture and how all of these computers have some form of input, output, a central processing unit, and memory. We talked about the various computer hardware components. So the motherboard, the CPU, those terms shouldn't be alien to you now. We talked about the memory hierarchy, how we have to make constant trade-offs between really fast but low capacity memory and really uh, large and high capacity memory, but uh, th that's really slow. And finally, we talked about Moore's Law. We talked about how every two years we basically see an exponential growth in computer performance and that is what has made computers from a toy that my dad once showed me in the 1980s you know that it was more of a hobbyist enthusiast thing to a technology that is pervasive in our lives so hopefully you've enjoyed this lesson uh, we're going to get a lot more in depth in the future lessons so you can look forward to that and other than that uh, have a great day and thank you for watching bye